title for this chapter is The Social and Cultural Origins of Power. So this is something that um, Baba Amos Wilson has, or, has already discussed a fair bit through chapters one and chapters two. Chapter one was a, a conceptualization of what power is. Chapter two uh, was talking about where power comes from, the bases of power. And uh, a big chunk of what he talked about in that chapter was indeed about uh, some of the organizational elements that, uh, where power comes from and different, you know, the different ways that uh, the different levels of organization, how they relate to the different levels of power that, that a particular group has. And now in chapter chapter three, of course, we're going to get into more specifically talking about culture and uh, social, the, as he said, the social and cultural uh, bases of power. So without further ado, let's get straight into this. So chapter three starts on page 56 and the first section is called culture and power. So uh, let's not waste any time. Let's get into uh, this, uh, this very, very eminent ancestors teachings with regard to this, uh, this topic. So here we go. Social power, he writes, is situated in that it is embedded in a broader social network or a social field. Social power is generated by the social alignment or relative positioning of individuals within groups and the alignment and position of groups vis-a-vis -vis each other within large social organizations, societies, cultures, nations, and various coalitions or alliances in order to achieve mutually desired ends. So social power, that's just defining what social power means. It's about individuals and groups interacting with each other for the purposes of uh, creating and uh, creating and furthering the power of the group that they're all part of. One of the most important contexts in which the alignment of individuals and groups is utilized to generate and exercise social power is that of culture. A culture is a type of power system which includes all of its members and the various groups and institutions which constitute it. A society or power or culture as a power system may be subdivided into a number of smaller and smaller power systems nested within or, 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 or organically related to one another. The overall power of a culture or society operationally emerges from these smaller power systems, which may include familial, kin, kinship, communal, regional, and other types of social and institutional organizations. Culture is man's adaptive dimension. And then he gives this quote from someone called Ashley Montague, which is, quote, man alone among the forms of animated nature is the creature that has moved into an adaptive zone, which is an entirely learned one. This is the zone of culture, the man-made, the learned part of the environment, unquote. Page 57, if societies are to survive, they must minimally satisfy certain biological, psychological, and social needs of their members. They must successfully counter those forces of nature and man which threaten their well being and their very biological survival. Culture is the social institutional instrument which is crucial for facilitating a people's adaptation to the complexities of their world. Therefore, its functional structure, cohesiveness, resilience, flexibility, responsivity to reality, evolutionary growth and development, or the relative lack thereof, to a very significant extent, determine its longevity and quality of life. Culture is learned and is the result of historically and conceptually created designs and patterns for living with and relating to others and the cosmos. So. I've talked about this many times, but uh, that's a, that's a very very important point because often we sometimes we're told to just strip culture down to music, clothing, hairstyles, that sort of stuff. You know these these very superficial imp they're important in and of themselves, but in the bigger picture, these are very superficial kind of outward signs of a culture or symbols. That's what we often talk to think of culture as just being about symbols and icons, but what Baba Amos Wilson is, uh, is is just introducing us there to is the point that culture is is all encompassing. It's about how 
a group of people interact with each other, is how that group of people uh, meets its needs, how, how that group of people basically it survives, uh, thrives and survives and keeps itself from extinction. And, you know, but more important than that, expands and develops and, you know, uh, culture is what enables a group of people to survive and further and, and prosper and blossom and in all the all those kinds of stuff. Culture is, I've heard other people say that culture is the immune system of a people, um, but it's not just, culture is not just about ideological things or, or, or spirituality or that sort of stuff. Culture is about all of these things that we're talking about in this book. Culture is about the, the way that we relate to each other economically. It's the way that we relate to each other on a family level. It's about the way we relate to each other on a social level, political level, all these kinds of things. So Baba Emma Swanson is just laying that out. And now he's going to go into, he's already said that a culture is made up of lots of subsets, lots of smaller components, one of which is familial. And now the next section, the next section here is called the family as a power system. So let's get into this. This is on page 57. And he writes, culture is a social machine, a power grid or a system as a as a holistic system, it is composed of a number of subsystems, power systems in their own right. The family is one such fundamental cultural subsystem. It is a system of social relations, hierarchical in structure, where different members exercise different privileges, prerogatives, and different levels of authority. The family is a primary organization, a fundamental generator or source of power, where the human and non-human capital resources of its members are pooled and shared as means of achieving its vital goals. These goals include sexual reproduction, socialization of its children, securing a common habitation, providing protection and affectional relations among its members, maintaining and enhancing the social status of its members and providing for their economic well-being. The family is a system where power is customarily and legally exercised, where its members are not only related by kinship ties, but by, sorry, by blood and a shared history, but relate to each other in terms of membership rights, duties, behavioral expectations, and authority. And it's funny, I've been, me and my boys, my sons have been watching a lot of nature programs lately, and we've been watching uh, you know, lions and all this sort of stuff, and wild dogs in particular, wolves. And you, you see that they've got, they, those, some of these creatures, some of these animals have very complicated social structures as well. Particularly, uh, we were, we were watching about wild dogs, African wild dogs, and they've got very intricate social systems where, interestingly, the females are at the, at the very top and, and males are at the very bottom. But there's all sorts of, you know, every 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 member of the clan or every member of the yeah, the clan has got a, their place very carefully, uh, very carefully laid out and very carefully um, circumscribed by the by the system, and in that way they share a sim similarity to us uh, as families. You know, in what we're supposed to have is families are supposed to have very clearly laid out uh, social positions, social roles that we're supposed to pay pl uh, play. But unfortunately, perhaps he's going to go into this in a minute. Unfortunately, for a lot of Africans in the diaspora and in the continent to an, a greater extent lately, those are being eroded because we've bought into Western concepts of the nuclear family. And thus we're buying into these individualized concepts of what family is all about. I can do whatever I want to do. People are, you know, people just want to just do whatever they want to do. And so we're losing some of this. But uh, anyway, I just thought I'd kind of point that out. So where are we? The character and personality of individual family members, especially its young, are developed, shaped, and continuously influenced by the organization and exercise of power and authority inside and outside of the family unit. Consequently, the family as a power system markedly influences its members, its members, particularly its young's attitudes toward and relationship to power and authority, both within and without the, the family. Thus, there is an important continuity between the nature of power, its, con its quantity, quality, and organization within the family, and the nature of social power and power, social and power relations between the family and its physical and social environment, including 
other families and institutions which together constitute a larger social system such as a clan, tribe, nation, or culture. This is page 58 now. Hence, the effective nature of power generated and exercised by a culture is intimately and, and reciprocally related to and dependent on the effective nature of the power generated by its family and other subcultural units. In other words, the power of a the power of a people, the power of a culture is only as is is grounded upon the power of the families that compose that 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 group, that culture. And this is something very important for people to understand that you can you can go on and on and on about Black liberation, African liberation. You can talk till you're, till you're, you know, blue in the face, as the saying goes, about all of these things. But if you're not paying attention to the family, to the African family, to the Black family, as parochial and conservative as it might sound, then all of your efforts are going to be in vain because the family is one of the most important subsets of the power uh, of uh, uh, culture. As it, uh, Baba Amos Wilson puts it, culture is a power system. And it's made up of smaller power systems. One of the most important power systems is the family. And if the family uh, is, you know, uh, dysfunctional overall, if families are dysfunctional within a community, then that's going to seriously hinder the ability of that community or that people to generate and, and further its itself and its, its interests. Generally, the power generated by a culture derives from the structured coalescence of interdependent family kinship groups, clans, and tribe for mutual defense against outsiders and other mutually beneficial outcomes. This coalescence of subcultural social units is usually organized and motivated by a mutually recognized leadership or governing establishment. This establishment usually fulfills its responsibilities through the creation, issuance, and enforcement of policies. At this level of organization, a culture may be defined as a political organization which exercises political power in its defense, economic and social interests as a whole, and in the interest of its subcultural group and individual members. As Dai contends, quote, true political power organizations begin with the development of power relationships between family and kinship groups, unquote. He goes on to state that, the habitual association of human beings in communities or local communities or local groups. J shout out to you, everything is politics. Peace and blessings to you. Nice to have you with us. Uh, glad you could join us today, Aya. Um, and yeah, looking forward to your insights and inputs as usual as usual today. Um, yeah, so the habitual association of human beings in communities or local groups generally leads to the introduction of some sort of political power organizations. The basic power structures are voluntary alliances of families and clans who acknowledge the same leaders, habitually work together in economic enterprises, agree to certain ways of conduct for the maintenance of peace among themselves, and cooperate in the conduct of offensive and defensive warfare. Thus, Power structures begin with the development of cooperation between families and kinship groups. Warfare frequently leads to another purpose for power relations, that is, ruling and exploiting people who have been conquered in war. Well-organized and militarily successful tribes learn to subjugate other peoples for purposes of political and economic exploitation, retaining them as subjects. The power structure of the conquering tribes takes another function, that of maintaining control over and exploiting conquered peoples, unquote, end of quote. So, so he just, he's just reiterating and, and re-emphasizing the critical importance of, of families, clans, uh, families and clans in actually consti constituting the people group in question and also uh, mobilizing the people in the people group in question to do what it needs to do defend itself or you know mobilize in in the offensive offensive um operations as obviously we see throughout human history this is something that's happened for you know in all parts of the world throughout human history shout out to you zizo by the way peace and blessings to you as well good to have you good, good to have you with us uh you said that 
Lions are the only social species of feline. Yeah, family or family oriented. I was quite I was quite interested to see to learn that actually that I didn't realize that so many of these cats, these big cats, are soul alone creatures. I just thought that they were because we only ever really see lions most of the time. You know, lions, packs of lions, uh, prides of lions, but leopards, cheetahs, jaguars, even you know what they're called um, pumas, uh, panthers, all these. Big cats, they just operate on their own. Once they're old enough to leave their parents, that's it. They're just on their own, apart from when they mate, and then they're on their own. So it's, it's an interesting one, actually. It's just quite fascinating. Um, and shout out to you, Lao Tzu. Uh, grand rising in the year 531 of the Ma'afa and the Nakba in solidarity with the people of Palestine, of the, yeah, the Palestinians. By the way, is this live? Yeah, we are live. We are live and direct in the house right about now on... Saturday, the 4th of November, 2023, at 9.18 p.m. here UK time. I know it's different where, we, where most of you guys are. Yeah, so we're live and direct in the house. Uh, the live the live streams, of course, everyone can join the live streams. Just to let you know, if you want to get the archive of the live streams, you can get it. You can get them there at elliewananda.substack.com. Um, and as you say, allow... Yeah, of course, peace, you know, solidarity, absolutely, with the people of Palestine. That, I mean, I mean, we could go off on a tangent, I won't, but it, it, it's almost, it's surreal how that thing is just going on and on and on. And, and seeing the, the blood-curdling statements that are coming from Israel and their supporters and, you know, the U.S. have just, have they just signed another 13 billion U.S. dollars or whatever in, in military aid to the, to the Israelis. It's just, it's almost surreal to see, but I hope people are just paying attention and understanding that, yeah, this is, I mean, we've literally just talked about here um, how, you know, an important element of, of, of social power, you know, power structures is about offensive operations. And this is what we're seeing in the Middle, in the Middle East right now, in the Levant right now, to, to a grotesque extent. Um, but yeah, okay, so... So, so that was a quote from Dai, and then we get back to the back to Baba Amos's words. He says that if we substitute the phrase economically successful tribes for the phrase militarily successful tribes in the latter italicized paragraph above, and think in terms of economic and political warfare instead of military warfare, we would more closely approximate the contemporary political economic relations between white Americans and immigrant Americans on one hand, and black Americans in the contemporary United States. That is the rather superior organization of family slash kinship and communal groups and resources of the white Americans and various immigrant groups, I lost my page, sorry, have facilitated their political and economic exploitation of the African American community. Besides the fact that the organizations are based on family kinship and where are we? Family kinship, community, and ethnic relationships. They are based more profoundly on cultural identity, values, and attitudes. Yeah. A culture generates effective power when it aligns its subcultural, social, and individual units, especially its family and communal units, in such a way that they can most effectively create and exploit its social, sorry, its human, social, and material resources to its own advantage relative to its environment and other groups or cultures. So that was interesting that he said there was that, it, it, yes, the, the, the family kinship and sort of ethnic identity is important, but more, more importantly, he says, they are based more profoundly on cultural identity, values, and attitudes. And, I mean, we're talking about... We're talking about Palestine. We're talking about the Israel-Palestine conflict, and uh, you know, thinking about the United States in particular and the United Kingdom. Oh, shout out to you, Temi. Temi, peace, peace, peace. Yeah, yeah, in and out, in and out. Of course, yeah. You're, you know, I know my my boys are sleeping, which is why I'm able to to talk freely for more than five minutes here. So, so, um, but you, you know, what's the connection between the United States and Israel? What's the connection between the United Kingdom and Israel? Well, they, you know. Yes, there's an ethnic connection because most of those Israelis are Europeans, but there's a there's a deeper connection as far as uh, the Judeo, what they call the Judeo-Christian connection, isn't it? They see themselves. I saw I saw an excellent video the other day on Twitter where 
some of us, various United States, various, I think they were senators or congressmen, I don't know what they were, I don't really understand fully. But anyway, this guy asked them and said, uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on, um, you know, Christian Zionism? And they were all to a, to a person like, yep, I fully agree with Christian Zionism. Israel has to be in that, you know, Israel has got a divine right to be there. And um, it's up to us to bless, whoever bless, blesses Israel will be blessed by God. And all the others, they were spouting all these things. And, you know, that's that is what unites them together. And it's not I'm not even I'm not even criticizing them really for that. It's just it's just a that's how they do that's how they do that's how they connect with, with each other actually we as african people we as black black people ought to have much more of a of a similar sense of of uh what's the word solidarity with with our you know our our people around the world we we should it should go without saying that we support for example the people of haiti in their struggles you know we, we should be committed to the to the well-being of Africans in India, Africans in Brazil, and so forth. It's just go without saying, you know, because we have a shared identity, a shared history, and we're committed to the same, you know, I suppose, yeah, kind of philosophical uh, worldview, if you like, some of the things we've been talking about in some of the other books. Um, but um, but anyway, that's the end of that, that section there. Let's get some of these comments here. Definitely want to keep in touch, keep up to date with these because, you know, otherwise we'll... So every, everything is politics said the West is genocidal. Yes, indeed. And openly genocidal, you know, happily, openly, you know, most of the time they try and hide it behind all their rhetoric, you know, and someone mentioned Urugu in a, chef, in a second. But they, you know, in Urugu, Marimba Ani, Mama Marimba Ani talked about the rhetorical ethic, which is... Arguably, the most important lesson that I got from that book was that was was how um, you know I, Europeans use the rhetoric. Europeans use the rhetoric of uh, peace and uh, you know harmony and all this sort of stuff and human rights and what what have you. They use that, but they they use that purely for the purposes of of hoodwinking everybody else they are not in any way committed to these things as you can just see by their history by their history you know uh by their by their colonial history by their history of enslavement and all these kinds of things they are not committed to those things whatsoever uh, and right now they are you know the, the mask is is off isn't it in the uk i, I mean i might talk, we might have said this last week but in the uk when israel started its bombardment they, you know, the Labour Party here in the UK, which is supposed to be the liberal lefty party, they were like, they were like Israel has a right to defend itself. They'd be asked, you know, they'd ask, journalists would ask them, so um, is, it, is it right that they're bombing children and this, that and the other? And they'd say, Israel has a right to defend itself. If there's not a war crime, yeah, Israel has a right to defend itself. You know, um, same with the government here, the government of the United States and all that sort of stuff. They're just, you know, it all comes out. It all comes out when they're, you know, when they're, when they're, when their critical interests are in question, they're like, listen, I'm not, we can't even pretend. We can't even pretend. We are backing our man in the Middle East, our policeman there in the Middle East. And we have to back our policeman there because if we don't, then we're going to lose all of our sway over the oil and all these other resources, strategic, you know, strategic resources in that area. Shout out to you, uh, Lao Tzu. You said, uh, side question, did you finish the book Urugu? Yeah, we did finish that book. Urugu, actually, um, yeah, we did that. That's the, the the full streams of all of that, all of those streams that we did are available on YouTube. So if you just go to my channel, Eli Wananda, uh, you'll find the full streams of that. I've got that as a as a kind of taster uh, series. Uh, brilliant, excellent book, just absolutely brilliant, brilliant book. And then and then you said, also, I'm not sure you're aware of this, uh, John. Henrik Clark, Marimba Ani, and Amos Wilson worked in numerous project together, projects together in New York. And great job, brother. Thank you. Asante Sana. Uh, yes, I am somewhat aware because Mama Marimba Ani talks about that in both uh, the, the, I think in the preface for or some of the sections in Yoruba, she, she makes a lot of reference to John Henrik Clark. John Henrik Clark is like probably the key figure who made that book happen, really. And I 
I've I've listened to a few lect a few lectures from um, Marin Baani where she speaks glowingly about Baba Amos Wilson and talks about some of the things that they they did together, and actually, just I mean this is a bit of a tangent, but I recently got this in the post today, which is um, a book that a lot of people have recommended me to to read from um, Amos Wilson, which is called Self Hatred, Self Defeat Towards a Reclamation of the African Mind, and I was just reading the preface today, which was. The preface was written, this book was only published in 2019, I believe, and the pref preface was written by someone called Sababu, what's the name? Sababu N. Plata, who was a long, is, he's still, you know, this person's still alive, long time collaborator of, of um, Amos Wilson. Anyway, Sababu talks about a lot of the history in the 1980s and makes reference to how a lot of these people, John Henry Clark, um, John G. John G. Jackson, um, Yosef Ben Yochanan, but then also uh, there's one thing talking about how in the 80s a lot of this ferment happened. Amos Wilson was there, and then the trips to the continent where Ashra Kwesi and Anthony Browder and all these names that were just being sometimes sometimes it could be we can think of these people just as just operating on their own, isn't it? You can just think, oh yeah. Amos Wilson just did his own thing and he wrote a book and he did, that, did, this, did this, that and the other. And actually probably an important thing for us to do is to probably really start to make sure that we document the history of the collaboration and the the, the works and the projects that these guys did together. Because they, they weren't just writing books and they weren't just doing lectures. They were, they were on the ground doing stuff together yeah um Tababu. yeah african world info systems yeah so i was i was because i know um Tababu's mentioned in i believe in blueprint for black power which is why the name was was familiar and so it was great to see first of all that this is a fairly new book and and to hear to hear Tababu really talking about talking about those those uh those those works those operations that they were kind of doing together so Peace and blessings to you. In the Afro-Native world, thank you. You pointed out that um, Baba Sababu ma manages African World Infosystems, the publishing company of Nana Amos Wilson's books. Yeah, all right. So that is a that is a joy to know, and I'm very very happy to be um, you know to, to be learning about all of this and, and helping to kind of ampl amplify the work that they're doing. Actually, because they published Blueprint, Blueprint for Black Power and all these other books. Okay, and then. Uh, Temi said, yeah, Temi said, give thanks that they didn't choose Uganda instead of Palestine for their homeland. Yeah, can you imagine? I was thinking about this the other day and I was thinking, would I have been born even if, because obviously I was born in Kenya, but my, my parents were up from Uganda. Obviously, it's just all colonial BS borders. And it's just, it's just, uh, it's strange to think how life might have been different if, if, if my homeland had been chosen because the in case anybody doesn't know the the British basically one of the suggestions that it, when when Zionism was becoming a thing in the early twentieth century late nineteenth early twentieth century uh, one of the, one of the things that some of these British politicians came up with was, was to say oh well we've got this chunk of land here that we own you know bloody colonial bastards um, why don't you go there you could go there there you go. That you create your land of Israel in uh, in this pearl of Africa. It's lovely there. You love it. Thankfully, I don't think it was ever seriously uh, considered by the uh, by the Zionists. But it's a scary thought. It's a scary thought to think like that could have been us. That could have been this. Could have been us right now. 